NICIF is 108 years old. It was born out of the labor movement of the early 20th century. Uh, a point of great pride for us uh, here is that Francis Perkins, FDR's labor secretary, played a pivotal role in not only establishing this organization, but leading it over 100 years ago. So it's an organization with a very rich history. Another important uh, fact to know about NICEF is that it was established in statute, so it's actually in the law. And it functions as both a state entity as well as a self-sustaining competitive insurance company. An insurance company, by the way, that's fully funded by premium income and investment income uh, with no taxpayer funding. Our core obligation here at NICEF is actually quite straightforward and simple. Um, we make medical and indemnity payments to injured workers, which is a long-term obligation. And the last thing um, I think it's uh, worthwhile remembering about NICEF is that we are a public asset owner with nearly $22 billion in assets, and we invest the premium that we generate in our insurance business as a fiduciary and a long-term investor in the capital markets. So to put it simply, there just aren't very many organizations like NICEF, organizations that are rooted in labor, that function as an insurer, that are part of the state, um, are public asset owners and long-term investors. But it's precisely this uniqueness that brings us to this conversation. We know that we can't meet our obligations to injured workers unless we ensure the long-term security and growth of our investment portfolio. But doing that in light of climate change is it easy? It brings opportunities and risks, but it also brings a lot of uncertainty and challenges. So in recognition of this, last year, NICEF published its climate action plan. The plan focused on decarbonizing our investment portfolio, financing climate solutions, and collaboration and engagement. But the story really doesn't end there for us. That's just the beginning. So today we'll start with the idea of science and climate impact. We'll move on to incentives and benefits. And then lastly, this idea of resiliency. So we have a couple of questions um, on each of these topics. And we'll kick off the conversation with you, Judith. How does science dictate policy, and should it? What I'm seeing is that scientists are, wor are working much harder to make their data decisionable and actionable. Um, we've seen many creating um, really up-to-date um, using up-to-date science to create um, and enable policymakers to model um, frameworks, to model po the implications of policy decisions. So this kind of strat strategic research and science for policy impact is catching hold among scientists. And we've seen several come to stakeholders and policymakers and ask, what data would be most useful to you in your decision making? And as that convergence occurs, we're going to see the capacity for science and policy to really do more than just bump up against each other gingerly and accidentally, um, but really with intentionality inform one another. I think the question really for this audience especially becomes, how do we integrate climate science into investment policy? Jeff, do you want to start us off? Sure. I think the, the important thing to, <clears throat> to remember there is to figure out, uh, building on the comments that, that, that have been made, what we can make strong statements about. So for example, we know uh, that the climate science is telling us that, that we're going to have differing changes around the underlying risk related to, to climate. Uh, and so with that as a basis, I think it's important that the incentives we develop for our investment policy build on the things that we know. And, and I often think about this problem through the, the lens of, of how we do modeling inside insurance. So I worked at Swiss Re for a number of years, and we, we make a difference, uh, we, we, we make an analytical difference between risk, which is where we understand the parameters driving the distribution of losses, and ambiguity. <clears throat> and ambiguity is best described as the unknown unknowns. So one of the things that climate change has done is it's introduced a lot of ambiguity into longer term investment uh, policy decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we have trouble. So we've got that problem. The second problem is we have this cognitive bias as human beings 
where we tend to overestimate change in the short term and we underestimate change in the long term. And I think it's important for a lot of institutions, and we were talking about this last night, to be very careful about matching the duration of your obligations. For, and for a lot of the entities that I interact with, whether they be reinsurers or uh, pension funds uh, or even just regular insurers, uh, often their investment policy is driven by one to three year uh, uh, focus and, and not uh, the actual duration of the liabilities. Now part of that has to do with the fact that there's not enough investments with proper long-term uh, durations. You know, so uh, like I would like to see more infrastructure related uh, investment paper. I mean, we certainly need that in, the, in this country. And so some of this is also incentivizing the investment creators so that we have the right kinds of investments. Because otherwise we end up misallocating capital at a national or a global level, which is often what we see now. I mean, we, we, and one of the great things about capitalism is you do get these corrections. So we kind of over allocate to tech. And if you think about the amount of capital that's gone into figuring out how to manipulate us to buy things, uh, that's not a good thing. So hopefully that tempers and we can now look more carefully at things like climate. And I think that the, the other thing to appreciate is that the uncertainty in the direction is not that much, meaning climate is uh, deteriorating in terms of the way it interacts with us as, as people dependent on things like ecosystem services. Uh, Gaurav mentioned that I do natural assets. It's like thinking about the value we derive from ecosystem services, such as uh, the air we breathe, the oceans, coastal protection, coral reefs, mangrove swamps, urban forests, all of that is valuable and not very well managed because we don't necessarily think about the incentives for protecting it. And these are opportunities actually for creating new investments that would be perfectly uh, sensible and proper, would meet the proper incentives for dealing with long-term obligations. I think the, the th same is also true for infrastructure. So I think those are some of the things that we need to think about but uh, the, the key point is this framing of what we know and what we don't know and being, being careful about in, ensuring that, that, that we're not kind of deceiving ourselves about those, those two pieces. We know enough that this is a problem around climate that we do need to think about how this enters into our investment uh, allocation process. And Andrew, you started to talk about this in your last answer, if you wanted to continue that conversation. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad Jeff picked up on the uncertainty, you know, because the uncertainty is such an integral part of you know, the day job as an, an asset manager and having an adaptive approach. And I think there's some challenges in deploying the thinking of the sciences into your decision-making process. And I think we see this in Europe in particular, where a lot of people will think that reporting of your climate metrics um, is actually part of the solution itself. Now, transparency is all well and good, but if the numbers themselves don't inform a decision, then they are you know, they're not really that helpful. And if, if it, in fact, they can be disadvantageous if you then think you've done the job by just mere reporting. So I, I, I think sort of there's too much emphasis on reporting in Europe enough on connection to, to, uh, to actual outcomes. I think that also drives the investment decision making into passive. And I think well, if you're being entirely passive in an adaptive system with a high level of uncertainty, you're almost going to be precisely wrong over the medium to long term. So there is you know, there is a case for having a more adaptive approach to thinking about the changing influences uh, within the system. Um, you know, often when I sit on with a, my acid owner hat on, I'll challenge our OCIO to talk about what when they, they're reporting our climate metrics, what decisions has it led to? And so looking at it from here, I think the big challenge that we have as investors is to begin to understand how those metrics frame future decision making, future allocation of capital. Because a lot of you know, metrics around environmental and social issues and climate um, don't link it to financial outcomes. Or they make some very bold assessments about numbers that, you know, over the very long term that you know, don't mean very much. So what we're trying to do is actually embrace that notion of uncertainty and take a forward-looking probabilistic view about the uh, company's likelihood of meeting a particular carbon objective, linking that to its capital allocation, 
and then trying to find where in the whole value chain of decision making that value is accruing. And that is going to be a dynamic concept. We can, we can understand the science, but different corporations doing different things at different parts of the cycle will be the ones that are overvalued or undervalued. And so we, we, we can't just take an absolutist view in the investment community. We have to take an adaptive view because you know, we still have to find where we're going to make those money. And it can be in transition, so the bad becoming good. It can be in the good provide, you know, solutions being provided to, for transition. But it also could be the risk management and what we should be avoiding because obsolete, obsolescence mm -hmm. is going to be a really big part of the transition over the next 10, 20 years. And it's always been part of what economics should be about, shumper to creative destruction. And if you think of the size of the forces at work here, that element is often misunderstood. And I think we should really be thinking about, you know, uh, not just stranded assets, but stranded business models uh, and those that can't change and who are doomed. So you know, it's got a lot of interesting I dynamics. I would just add one thing to that, Andrew, which is that I think it's more than really making a, a, a blended kind of portfolio and seeing these various time horizons. I think even the most conservative investor um, who doesn't think that um, their mandate is ESG or climate or, or science needs to really recognize that in this environment we can no longer outrun the risk. It is no longer about black swans. It's about things that are occurring with such frequency and are threatening any kind of investment. And so taking these issues into account, even if you're not a committed client, um, a climate investor or ESG investor, increasingly is part of your basic fiduciary responsibility. I, I thought we might have got away with not using the dreaded ESG <laughs> acronym. But, 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 <laughs> really, yeah, but know, I, but, but it's as a fiduciary, point. as an yeah. investor, it needs to frame your investment decisions um, to understand the risk. And it's interesting, the FCA in the UK in trying to frame that has basically said the consideration of environmental and social issues and how they're governed is just fiduciary duty yep. because it's, a, it's potentially missing out material financial information if you don't do it. So it's comply or explain. Don't use it as a label. I always say there's no such exactly. thing as ESG. It's about a practical series of nuanced uh, material issues that will change across industry, country and dynamically over time, but it's an input, not certainly not a label to be aspired to. Yep. Yeah. Actually, Annika, can I just give one interesting <laughs> example? I think yeah. we've <laughs> off screen. Yeah, no, we have, but, but, <laughs> but, but there's this interesting, because uh, Judith mentioned Black Swan, and this is a kind of a pet peeve of mine, because a lot of things they call Black Swans are actually technically uh, what an economist uh, who I quite like uh, uh, calls a gray rhino. <laughs> and so a gray rhino is a large latent risk that we just are kind of ignoring, right. either intentionally or unintentionally. And one of those, which I see in my one concern analysis quite regularly, is the fact that many power substations lie in areas that haven't flooded for many, many years because like they're near rivers that just didn't flood before. We're seeing this in California right now. And all of a sudden, climate change creates this new normal where flooding in these basins is more regular, and your power grid is now at risk. And so you talk about fiduciary responsibility, very few investors are thinking about that downside risk. Now this is a very specific example, but it's one that comes out of data analysis today yeah. because we understand these interacting effects. Because a lot of the work that I have a problem in the ESG space is at a high level. It's like, well, I'm gonna haircut things at the financial statement level. We now have data where we can actually start understanding causal relationships. And that allows us potentially to go after these gray rhinos. Our next topic is on incentives. So how do we align incentives in the system with climate science? I mean, one, one of the things that's different today in this space compared to, say, 10 years ago, is we now have more data than we've ever had. So this is not just vended data, but it's also data off the internet uh, that can be scraped and curated. There are firms like One Concern that actually do this as part of their business uh, value proposition. You also have better analytics. The machine learning that, that we're using these today uh, is, is really about filling in incomplete data, filling in missing data. And we have a lot more compute power than we had 10 years ago. 
that all creates an opportunity now to do granular analysis that was not possible before. And I think that's something also that people just need to understand. Because often I find people saying, well, it'd be great to have the incentives to do this analysis. Uh, even if you look at the comments on some of the SEC proposals, some of the response is, well, this sounds good in theory, but it's really hard to do in practice. The truth is, you can do it today. You have to hire the right people, you have to get the right systems, a lot of firms don't want to do that. But if we can create the incentives in the ecosystem, then I think you get to the point where you'll get better decisions and ultimately get better outcomes. Yeah, great. I think that's really interesting. I think it's very true. Um, and one thing I want to just circle back to, you mentioned how incentives change based on your, what stakeholder you're talking about, and I think that's very true, and it's really important for all of us to kind of understand the roles that we play within this greater system. Um, so our next question really relates to this in terms of what role do you see as um, asset owners versus asset managers? What role do they play in helping companies transition toward cleaner business practices or more transparent reporting of business practices? Andrew, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, so uh, sort of straddling both you know, sides, you know, mm -hmm. it's really interesting to see the debate in the UK about the interplay between the asset owner and the asset manager particularly when it comes to the other side of data, which is what I'd call stewardship activities and, and, and the, the actual engagement with corporations mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on that data and, and what it, it tells you about them, or actually even challenging the data because there is still a problem that a lot of data is wrong, particularly when it comes from third-party ESG data providers. There's a, a sloppiness still in what is often called data but is a matter of opinion. Mm -hmm. And so we do a lot of engagement, and we do, uh, and there's a big, in Europe, a big sort of social obligation for engagement around environmental and social issues, often which asset managers aren't well suited to do, because we have the competition for making money, we have to beat an index and things like that, and, and, and it also puts us sometimes in you know, challenging positions about taking a set of you know, values. However, I think what I would like to see asset owners do is, and we are beginning to see this, we've seen this with the asset owners in America uh, engaging with Apple on uh, workers' rights in stores, uh, is that the asset owners, I think, have a, a far more powerful voice. They tend to have the, the longer duration to their assets. They of, often come with a sense of purpose, like NYSIF, uh, that is associated with their, their, with their purpose and their incorporation. And, and I think it could, what I think we will see in the future is the recognition that the asset owners can actually become engaged with, in conversation with the companies that uh, they own, even if those own, that ownership is through a third party asset manager. And I think that's sort of going to be a really important uh, element. These companies then, I think, respond far more when it's actually the primary owner of the capital uh, than, than when it's uh, maybe just an asset manager. And even within asset management, the way I see the dynamic working there on that engagement is that if it's the analyst and the portfolio manager, the allocator of the capital, rather than an overlay manager, uh, in a separate department talking, then you get a very different response from the CFO and, and the CEO because they're actually talking to people who might decide to buy or sell who aren't coming at it from a particular values based. But that's why I think the asset owners have a big role to play because they are the owners of the, uh, the primary capital. They are the people that ultimately should be setting the direction uh, that they want their assets flowing in. So I think that's one new area that we should begin to explore more. I explored that area in my book, oh. <laughs> and so uh, moving back and talking about this fundamental shift that we began to see as the asset owners realize that they are the longer term stewards of capital, that's particularly, or that was true earliest, I think, for the large pension funds who are saying to themselves, who do we represent, who do we need to protect, um, the citizens of our country or the citizens of our state? Um, and so began to realize that they could take a more activist view and put much more direct pressure on their asset managers. In March of 2020, GPIF, the Japanese pension fund, CalPERS, um, and the USS, the UK's largest pension fund, issued a joint directive in which they said to their asset managers, 
um, we, in our diligence process, will be analyzing your attention to sustainability, to climate change issues, to what kind of long-term view you're taking for protection of all stakeholders, in including the environment, <coughs> as a stakeholder. It was a surprising, actually, from that group of asset uh, owners statement, um, but it caught everyone's attention. There are many pension funds now, many asset managers that are pushing, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, many asset owners that are pushing their asset managers intensively in the diligence process um, to answer these questions before they make an investment. Um, questions around sustainability, around ESG, around human rights, around workers' rights. It's much broader than climate and sustainability for many of these asset owners, again, given their perception of their mandate. So much more use in the diligence process. GPIF has linked their fee structure to their money managers for certain kinds of sustainability mm -hmm. outcomes. Um, which is a very significant action. Um, and we see now owners being willing to take funds out when they are able to do it if they don't think that they're meeting their goals. So lots of momentum in the last um, four years, I think, on the part of the asset owners who are getting much more muscular, <laughs> much more aggressive than just handing the money over and say, make me a lot of money. Um, I also, to your uh, second point, I'm seeing many of the asset owners interacting with the companies directly. So um, the Danish pension fund, for example, took uh, the Danish oil and gas company, which is now known as Orsted, and they lent them money in, in a debt structure, but also a convertible so that ultimately it would come to equity um, in order to build a series of wind farms in Denmark. Orsted is now the largest producer of wind energy in all of Europe. And this came from a collaboration between the asset owner and the companies. So if money managers can be circumvented in some ways by the asset owners, we're going to see a very interesting new set of dynamics. I'll just finish by saying the money ma managers are not only noticing this, they are becoming much more robust um, in terms of answering these requests. We now see every asset class having these kinds of investments. We've seen, as you know, private equity and, and VC jump in with climate funds and ESG funds and the like. We see it in public equity funds, obviously many, many bond structures. So the money ma managers um, are responding to the asset owners with a tremendous amount of innovation um, across sure. all of these asset classes. So lots of interesting things, I think, in these dynamics that are emerging that are so important. And we're very grateful in the UK for Orsted because they contribute half of our renewable energy. And at the moment, we're getting more than 50% yeah. of our energy coming from uh, in low carbon sources. You know, it's amazing in Britain that we, we've actually managed to decarbonize our electricity grid and yeah. nobody's really noticed it. <laughs> <laughs> Orsted has a, a great quote, um, something along the lines of, in the realm of decarbonization, there's no competitors, only partners. And I think that really relates to this mm. idea in terms of asset owners and asset managers. We all have this kind of shared responsibility. Um, so I do want to kick it next to Gaurav as an asset owner, kind of giving that perspective as well. Right, sure. Um, so I think, look, uh, you know, the momentum that Judith is talking about and, and the, the more muscular nature of, of asset owners, I think that's very healthy. I think the Orsted example is a remarkable example. That's really the impetus is coming from asset owners. I do want to uh, touch upon the incentive piece and how that relates to all this. You know, at the end of the day, um, it's the asset owner that's best situated to focus on these things on an ex-ante basis, as Jeff, Jeff has said, because um, government is reactive. Right? The incentives there are different. Um, so you, you're not going to focus on legislation or government action. Government tends to be very reactionary. There's a crisis, then there's this big legislation that follows a crisis. It's very reactionary. So it's the asset owner um, uh, you know, taking the initiative, asking those questions, that's really going to move the ball forward. And that's what makes this space um, that much more important and the muscular nature of asset owners. 
uh, that much more important in this um, larger debate. I think the question around asset managers is a great one as well. I think the greater due diligence, asking a lot of questions, uh, I think that that's very, very important from an asset owner's perspective. I do think that asset managers um, should be focused around that due diligence and responding um, and, and sort of uh, uh, paving the way to a greater understanding for asset owners. There are lots of different funds, lots of acronyms, um, lots of disclosures. Uh, I think bringing all that information home uh, for an investor that wants to do the right thing uh, is a very important element in all of this that asset managers really need to uh, take uh, hold of uh, and, and add a lot more value uh, to this equation. In what ways should we be considering resiliency in both investment decisions and climate change? Um, we've touched really on the issue, which is this is a moment in which climate has become the new normal, mm -hmm. essentially. There isn't a week that goes by that we don't hear of some kind of event, whether it's a climate-related event as climate change accelerates, and so natural disasters, hurricanes, floods, wildfires, tsunamis, um, but also other kinds of crises, cyber attacks, terrorist attacks. Um, and building resilience is never more necessary to protect our assets, and of course, lives as well. So lives, livelihoods um, in every element benefit from a focus on resilience. I think COVID-19 really warned us that more crises with more devastating impacts really can be around the corner. That is the gray rhino kind of notion. And it makes the need to build resilience, which is building the capacity to prepare more effectively for any crisis, not just the last crisis, building the capacity to rebound more quickly and effectively if something should occur, and then building the capacity to tra transform and grow if a disruption occurs. Often we say, oh, this is so terrible, I just want everything to get back to normal without recognizing that normal often has the elements that made you vulnerable in the first place. So whether you're doing diligence as an investor or you're leading a company as a CEO or running any other kind of institution, there are five resilience characteristics that really can be built and practiced and they need to be assessed in your investment decision. This is a, a vibrant and exciting area. It's full of innovation. You mentioned earlier uh, Jeff's work on natural resources. We're seeing a lot of um, new investment vehicles starting to be experimented with um, to protect assets like air and the rivers and, mm -hmm. and uh, lots of creativity around that. And so I would, I would watch that space. Um, very, very carefully. It's investable and it's critical in order to protect us in climate change. This is so important. Of we, we really need to think not in our little boxes, our little silos, but in this notion of system change, system thinking, and how we're all connected. You know, we talked here for about, we started with climate change and we talked, ended up on social inequality. Mm -hmm. You know, these things are, are, are linked. It's really very important to actually have that joined up thinking. Because when you're an investor, you want to think where in the whole value chain the value is going to accrue. So for me, in that sort of grubby money-making end, you know, that's how I have to think about it. But I have to think about how it's connected to all these other issues and how we could all can have a collective voice to influence and change the system. Because that notion of resilience, if I turn it into the notion of, of a corporation, it's about relevance. It's not just about resilience. If you're not resilient, you're not relevant in the future. And how do you think of it as an investor about keeping companies relevant in an ever-changing world? Really look forward to having similar conversations and building upon the themes that we've developed here today. Thank you so much.